All right, looks like we're live. Thanks, Layla. Welcome back to another episode of Quarantine Quarters. I think this is our 26th episode. Um, welcome back. It's been a year, everybody. Wild, wild time. I'm Madison, and I'm one of the co-founders of Green Buffalo Productions. Here we have Ellen, the other co-founder of Green Buffalo Productions. Hi, Ellen. Hello, I'm here too. How are you doing, everyone? You can't answer me, but I'm asking you anyway. Happy <laughs> Friday. <laughs> it's been a long week and we're here to read some amazing plays. So this is going to be super fun. We've got a great lineup today. Um, and of course, I didn't pull the slideshow up uh, before we did this. So I'm going to have to find it uh, as we go. But big special shout out and special thanks to Leila Janti, our very first board member, producer, playwright, actor, director, friend. And a very special thank you to Zach Hattrick, our second board member, producer, director, actor, playwright friend, who is also a pretty cool video guy. We're not getting rid of the title. We're going to keep it. It's my favorite thing. I um, did maybe take it out the slideshow just to no! make some room, but it's okay. <laughs> Anyways, um, we're here to do some really fun, great plays. Before we get started on that, we just have a couple of housekeeping announcement things. We're really excited to hear that um, things are starting to open up again. Um, but in the uh, idea of safety, we, um, are, we're going to continue to do these quarantine quarters from the safety of our own homes and bring you new plays all whenever we can. Um, I was going to say all the time, but that, you know, maybe not all the time, but like enough of the time. Um, yeah, a significant also, amount of the time. A significant <laughs> amount of the time. We are going to be bringing you a ton of new content if you are a patron. Um, I'm sure that Layla will stick that into the chat um, as I talk about it. But we have tons of new fun things happening for this new year on Patreon. Um, we have a couple of patrons that we're going to shout out later on in the show. Um, that's one of the many perks that you'll get um, from the Patreon. You can also be a bigger part of the Quarantine Quarters on Patreon. As you'll see, if you're a writer, we're, you're going to get an email today. and We would like to thank Jack Levine for giving us our some of our prompts this week. So you can also do that at any level on our Patreon. Um, $5 will get you um, exclusive access to our spooky one-act um, spooky short films that we did over the summer. Um, and released last October because we couldn't let Spooky die. Hashtag Spooky never dies. You will get new episodes every month of our newest radio dramas, um, 2018 Emerald Terrace, which I have been editing. And let me tell you, they're pretty darn good. There are two episodes up right now with four plays in total. We have directors, actors, writers from not only Western New York, but actors from all over the place um, participating in this event. So it's a really super fun time. The plays are amazing. And um, episode two just dropped. And if you decide to you know, donate a little bit more than $5 a month, you also get exclusive interviews with directors and writers and myself as I play my character, the property manager, Madison Sedler of... 2018 Emerald Terrace because you know gotta ham it up can't just be normal for five minutes anyway <laughs> but that's what you can get every month on Patreon um it's really great it really helps us out when it comes to renting out theater spaces um we we work with the Ascension of the Arts um as a storage space exclusively so it helps us pay them um it helps us pay our actors and um you know keep afloat during this otherwise uncertain time um we have a bunch of new things coming to patreon as well um and you might get a little special thanks if you decide to you know join today we also read everybody's name on the podcast this isn't a podcast whatever this is <laughs> quarantine quarters um we read all of your names and everybody knows that you have done some really cool great things for us so definitely look into joining the patreon 
Um, I'm going to stop talking about it now because I will talk about it again later. But Ellen, you want to take it from here? Yeah, sure. Okay. So become a patron. That's what you got to do. Step one. Um, <laughs> step two, um, we just have a couple more things uh, to talk about before we get started. Uh, one of which is uh, our first short film of the year, Look Up, which was written by Sarah Henderson. We are We've cast the majority of it. There's some extra roles that we haven't quite cast yet, but our first read through is tomorrow. So we will be doing that and then uh, filming throughout the beginning of this year. Um, this is again written by Sarah Henderson. She had actually submitted it to the Buffalo Theater Workshop, which Layla will talk about in just a moment, um, to just have us take a look at it. It was 10 minutes and we had her expand it to 30 because we liked it so much. So um, just a little pitch for the Buffalo Theater Workshop, send your stuff in and we want to help you produce it. So um, again, yeah, if you are writing anything uh, just starting out or if you're trying to polish something off before sending it off to production, please send it to the Buffalo Theater Workshop. Um, real quick, uh, April, I'm sorry, this is March. I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> March is, uh, is uh, Women's Month, just to kind of to say that right at the top here. And we were coming off of February, Black History Month. Um, so just real quick, wanted to address that we have some specific things just to kind of take a look at throughout the year, even though last year, 2020, was a lot of, there was a lot of action happening uh, for civil rights and for um, just trying to be as uh, proactive as possible as a reminder, a sad reminder that is. Um, Breonna Taylor was murdered just about one year ago uh, this month. So we just wanna make sure that we are acknowledging that and uh, moving forward with um, uh, police reform and all kinds of reform, uh, progressive reform for everybody that we support as a company. So uh, with that said, there are some really neat um, authors to take a look at this month. My personal favorites being Janet Mock, Bell Hooks, Toni Morrison, Angela Davis, Gloria Anzaldua, Britt Bennett, and Angie Thomas. So let me know if you want some recommendations because I've got them for you. Um, as we go on here, Layla, you want to just say a little bit more about Buffalo Theater Workshop and maybe the Ghost Light podcast? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Buffalo Theater Workshop is a group that was started by Emma English as a way for local artists to have their work reviewed and heard out loud. I know that for a lot of people when writing plays and uh, film scripts, it can be a very uh, isolating experience um, because a lot of it is by yourself unless you're working with a collaborator. But it is always nice to hear uh, what your work sounds like in the world um, and read by actors. Um, so Emma came up with the idea of doing the Buffalo Theater Workshop as a place for uh, writers to hear their work out loud so that they could then move forward and edit it and polish it and make it better. Um, I myself have had uh, what was originally a short play turned into a longer play because of all the really great feedback that I got from the Buffalo Theater Workshop and still working on it, still making it better. Um, if you are a playwright or someone who is writing a script for film and you have something that you really um, love, but you know that it needs some work, absolutely submit to the Buffalo Theater Workshop. We're always looking for new scripts to read every month and we're always interested in hearing new voices. Um, and then for the Buffalo Ghost Light, uh, it is a podcast that is accessible through our Patreon. Uh, if you are interested in listening to it, both Zach and I uh, record for it. Uh, we are the hosts of that podcast. It's very cool. Um, we talk about a bunch of different subjects. Of, we've talked about theater superstitions. We have talked about um, uh, adapting plays to film. And that should be... Uh, releasing sometime in March, if not early April. So we're very excited about that. Um, and we really hope that you enjoy it and uh, let people know. Um, but yeah, so very, very cool. That's, that's all. <laughs>
Okay, <laughs> sounds good to me. All right, so uh, we're going to get into our first play of this evening, which was written by one of our brand new quarantine quarters playwrights, Topher Carlson. I believe he's written two or three at this point. So this is our first uh, um, winning play by Topher. So that's awesome. Um, he is using the dialogue, uh, Mr. Jingles Doesn't Lie, which I believe was submitted by... Um, by Pete, right? Pete Sheldon? Pete Sheldon oh. submitted yes. that. Patreon yes, love it. Pete Sheldon become a Patreon, so you can submit things too. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> okay. He also used, we're stuck like two pieces of Velcro, and it's whatever. Props in this play include a basketball, a jar of marinara sauce, guess who submitted that one, uh, and an elephant enamel pin. Was it you, Maddie, or was that actually Pete? It's a me, Maddie. <laughs> Okay, and the setting, I believe, if I'm remembering correctly, is a high school rooftop. So let's get into it. I'm going to be reading the stage directions. And then as for our actors, let me navigate back to my list here. Our actors are um, Larry, Chad Short, Kristen, Hannah Lee DeFreitz, uh, Corey, Christian Hall, and Beth Heidi Buckler. Okay. Superb Owl. Lights come up on a high school rooftop where three teachers are observing owls in trees behind the school. It's winter and they are bundled up, but they have a potluck table set with food and thermoses of hot cocoa. The call of the great horned owl is heard. There it is. We all heard it, Larry. I know. It, it's just... It's exciting for me, too. Another owl responds to the first one's call. It's just so cool. Do you think they're a mated pair? Probably. It's about the right time of year for them to start courtship. How amazing would it be if they nested back here? We could have owl potlucks all I mean, the time. I'm definitely up for observing owlets. They are adorable little fur balls. Like, stupidly adorable. I can't wait. Are there any pictures on your phone? I might. If anyone does, it would be you, Kristen. I think that's a compliment. She passed I have her to pocket. check my phone after. I think it's in my car. No worries. I can also just Google it myself. Corey pulls out their phone and searches for pictures of outlets. Oh my god. I can't even stand how cute they are. Let me see. They're so fuzzy. I can just imagine what they're saying to each other. Why are you so close to me? I don't know. Why don't you move? I can't. We're stuck like two pieces of Velcro. That seems oddly specific. And maybe a little anthropomorphic. But I would be excited too. You know, I've never actually seen an owl before. I mean, I grew up in the middle of nowhere, so I've heard lots of them. But this is the first time I've actually gotten to observe them. Two. Well, not the growing up in the middle of nowhere part. I was more of a Stepford Wise sub suburb kid. I'm sorry. Me too. They had a rule in our development saying we couldn't have anything feeding wild animals in our yard. My mom got reported to the HOA three times for a hummingbird feeder. That's insane. Also, one of the reasons I moved out of the house and came to Northeast for college I mean, my parents snowboarded and moved to Florida anyway a few years ago, so some other suckers in that community now. <laughs> Even when I lived in an apartment complex, I tried to keep my feeder addiction going. I mean, they weren't really allowed either there, so I had to be a little sneaky about it to avoid getting in trouble. It's why I only had three of them on my balcony. Only three? Yeah. I might have a bit of a problem. Well, how many do you have now? You really don't want to know. I've got 11. That's crazy. Agreed. But that's fewer than my crazy bird-obsessed inner monologue wants me to have. So there's certainly that. Also... I think my girlfriend would leave me if there were any more feeders. She's very patient, but sometimes when she refers to the garden as my aviary, it sounds a little bitter towards the birds that visit. Yeah, 
I can just imagine Pete coming down, coming home and finding 11 feeders in the yard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's a little tightly wound. You think? I mean, when you had us over last year for the cookout, he put up a temporary fence to keep us off the lawn. In Pete's defense, he had just fertilized. Oh, I will not defend him on that point. He had fertilized the lawn two weeks earlier. He just didn't want people walking on his precious greenscape. That's his crazy. Your words. Beth enters wearing a football jersey and carrying a jar of marinara and inexplicably a basketball. Hello, party people. Let's get this game on. Who's got the mozzarella sticks? Because I got the sauce. Beth considers spiking the jar of marinara, but reconsiders. She spikes the basketball instead, only to watch it bounce off stage. Beth, I'm glad you could make it. Me too. You know, I thought it was a little weird watching the game on the roof, but I can really see the appeal. We've got all this space, we can cheer as loud as we want, and even get down with the halftime show without overheating. It's perfect. I mean, it's around. almost game time, right? Where's the TV? TV? Corey, you're saying that like you don't really know why we need a TV for a Super Bowl party. Um... Beth? Larry. Beth, we aren't watching sports ball tonight. <laughs> One, you know what football is. Stop trying to pretend you don't. Two, and this may be the more salient question here, but what do you mean we're not watching football? How can you have a Super Bowl party without the Super Bowl? Are you going to listen on a radio? It's kind of old school, but you can't really see the commercials on the radio. I think it's a little further from what you were thinking than that. This isn't a Super Bowl party, Beth. <sighs> For the love of them, why the hell did you invite me to a Super Bowl? Superb owl. That's what he said. No, no, it's not. It's a superb owl party. You keep saying that, but I don't think you really know what it means. Beth, listen very closely. Superb Owl. <laughs> what the hell is a superb owl? The great horned owls hoot again, responding to each other. Oh no. Yeah. <laughs> you can't be serious. It's insane. I mean, it's it's whatever, but insane to watch owls and share potluck? It's, it's nice. But it's Super Bowl Sunday. <laughs> Who doesn't watch the Super Bowl? A lot of people, actually. Aside from you three. Well, last year, for example, the majority of Americans... I'm talking people about the people who don't watch the big game. Right. It was somewhere around 110 million viewers last year, and since the U.S. has more than 300 million people living in it, I mean... I'm just a math teacher, but that's much less than half. That just seems so wrong. I mean, everyone I know, besides you nerds, no offense. Oh, none taken. Everyone watches it. I'd personally rather extract both of my eyes with this pin. That's gross. Larry holds up a relatively large elephant-shaped enamel pin. That's gross. So is football. Burn! Do you really hate it that much? More. Definitely Absolutely. more. Why? It's a great game. And it brings all these fans together. I've never been more bored in my life than the one game that Lydia convinced me to watch. I thought maybe I had been missing something during the last 33 years of my life. Nope. Wow. It's really hard for me to believe that. It's why she's at her parents' house for a Super Bowl party, and I'm here watching something that's actually interesting at a superb owl party. For me, it was being in marching band. We had to go watch every home game, which took football from a game that I tolerated to one that I have a strong negative reaction to even thinking about watching. I just don't like sports in general. 
I mean, they're great for exercise and fun to play to watch. I'd be asleep five minutes into the game. Which is why you're all here. Literally hanging out with some owls. It's like almost un-American. I'm going to ignore that. The owls vocalize again. Fine. I'll bite. Beth goes to the edge of the roof to look at the owls in the trees. Uh, there are two of them? The way they're talking to each other means they're probably going to mate. Here? Maybe. They'd need to find a good location, and they don't build their own nests, so if there's an old hawk nest nearby, they might. Oh, cool. I mean, I guess that's pretty cool. And baby animals are cute, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's adorable. Right? Adorable little balls of fluffy feathers. How can you not want to watch that go on? I mean, it's really adorable. But right now, they're just kind of pecking at each other. What? Yeah. Uh, what, are, what are they doing? It's like some kind of weird makeout session. I think it's part of their mating behavior. Are you the expert? I mean, I like birds, but you're the obsessed one here. That's fair, but I actually don't know. I know they are monogamous, but I don't know much else about their mating behaviors. Maybe they do some kind of preening. Is that what you call that? I think it looks like the one on the left is trying to eat the one on the right's face. Sure. I can see. See that, I guess. All right, friends, as cool as this is, and I'm not going to lie, it's definitely more interesting than I thought when you first explained you were up here for a superb owl party. Still can't really say that without feeling a little insane, but I won't be staying. I won't be staying. Yeah, hard pass. I'm not missing the Super Bowl, even if we're not in it this year. Go on, get out of here. You won't be utterly offended? Would it really matter if we were? No. Sorry, that sounds awful. But I'd rather watch football than be up here, and I don't want to have to deal with all of my students talking about something that I didn't get to watch. Cool. Sorry. No, it's fine. To be honest, I was a little shocked that you actually showed up today. Which <sighs> makes sense, given your misreading of Super Bowl. Right. I'm just going to go. I can make it to the other party I was invited to before kickoff. I just hope they aren't as crazy as you lot are. Beth exits, leaving the jar of marinara sauce that she's been holding the entire time on the table with the food. So that just happened. <laughs> yeah. But that's Beth for you. I don't know whether to feel insulted or just unsurprised. I'd go with neither. I've stopped caring what sports fans, excuse me, sports ball fans think about my interests. I think they watch mind-numbing athletic contests. They generally don't understand how I don't. No matter how many times I explain that I'm just not interested. Yeah, it's kind of weird like that. The yeah, owls vocalize again. What are they doing now? Looks like one of them is bowing to the other. I think that's the male. It looks a little smaller too. Which makes sense. This is so cool. Superb owls any day. Me too. Lights come down. End of play. Thank you guys so much for reading. And thank you, Topher, for writing the superb owl play. Um, I have to say that Hannah also wrote for this week that, um, that Topher's play came from. And it was such a hard decision. I loved both of them so much that uh, it was great that Hannah wrote two more plays for me to pick from us to pick from next week so and then she won so that was great um do we want to read off our little list of patrons i shouldn't oh. say little it's getting quite long it's getting quite large um we have gone from the beginning of the pandemic to like from like four patrons to 27 Woo! so here we go let's try to get them all and get them all pronounced correctly which is gonna be go. the true <laughs> challenge Thank you so much to Katie Schwebka, Ryan Schlea, Wayne Conover, Sean Cheeky, 
Leslie Cairns, Sarah Henderson, Zoe Kiriazis, Deanna Hariluck, Leslie Lusterman, Kelly Buth, Scott Seifritz, right? Got it. Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> it's only been a whole year. We can finally. It's only been a whole two years since we've been working with this man. Elizabeth Pope, Lori Mara, Gwendolyn Davis, Laurel Walford, Derry Howell, Pete Sheldon, Brian Shearer, Susan Miles, Emily Beistrack, Chris Barker, Alyssa Grace Adams, Ryan Hennenberger, David Wysocki, Jack Levine, Kayla Ruman, and Sarah Emerling. If you want to be on this list, it's never too late, and we'll get an email while we're doing this, and I'll be very excited and probably yell your name at the top of my lungs. So we all know that's what you want. What are you waiting for? Five dollars gets you so many cool things. <laughs> oh my gosh, I sound like a car salesman. You can't. All right, let's, let's, let's keep, keep moving on. We have a super fun, wild play by Matt Riddler tonight called Snowmageddon. Um, really thrilled to have Matt, who's a local writer, um, sending stuff in. He has um, been part of the Buffalo Theater Workshop. He actually wrote a Panic at the Disco musical, which was the first um, Buffalo Theater Workshop that was ever to be had ever. Um, so we're thrilled to have him write for us every couple of weeks. And I... I literally read this and was like, this is it. This is totally the one that we're going to read tonight. So the dialogue that was for, and this was the last one we did. So not the last week of March, but the second to last, or not the last week of February, but the second to last week of February. Um, the dialogue was, I won't apologize. Don't worry about me. If I was a breadstick, what flavor do you think I would be? Shout out to Layla for winning the best quote that week. The props were a lollipop a space heater, and a comic book. And the setting that he chose was a 1950s themed diner. And so my name is Madison Sedler. I'll be reading the stage directions tonight. We have Tanya being played by Heidi Buckler, Barney being played by Christian Hall, Nadine being played by Hannah Lee DeFrates. And Hannah and Christian are also in a show tonight with the Windows Theater. So if you want to make this a true double feature, go on over to the Windows Theater later after this and go see them there. But until then, we do have Snowmageddon by Matt Riddler. Lights up on a vibrant 1950s themed diner somewhere in the country, somewhere north. Black and white checkered floor, red booths and stools lining the bar. The light blue walls filled with framed pictures. The radio is on, music playing. It is dusk and snow is ferociously outside. Snowing ferociously outside. There's a small space heater by the front door. The diner is empty except for Tanya, a waitress, who is wiping down the bar. She is dressed in a blue 1950s dress with a white apron. Her huge hair reaches towards the sky, held by a lot of hairspray. She wears a name tag that reads Tanya. She comes out from behind the counter on roller skates. She brings a tray to clear off one of the booths. As she clears the table, the song ends and the radio hosts voice is heard. And it appears that this killer winter storm is continuing to wreak havoc on all of us. It's half of the state until further notice. Weather radars show total coverage for miles and miles and a uh, this just in. The governor has just issued a travel ban due to the increasing reports of so-called killer snowmen. These reports are most likely a result of mass hysteria. However, Unexplainable disappearances have also been reported. All roads are closed until sunrise. Stay in your homes, stay warm, and stay calm. From all of us here at WCLA. Sound of a door slamming open. Oh, very funny, Daryl. That's the worst snowman costume I've ever seen. Daryl? Daryl, quit playing around. Crash. There's more crashing and crunching sounds, more screaming. The broadcast goes silent. Then a faint, heavy breathing is heard. Tanya has finished up her cleaning at the table and turns around to face the radio. She skates back behind the bar, sets down her tray, and switches the radio off. She is unable to move for a moment. Her eyes gaze around the diner nervously. She stares out the window at the storm. She skates to the front door and locks it. <sighs> Not today, Laura. Not today. She skates back behind the bar to take care of the dirty dishes. 
A frantic knock at the door. Tanya jumps, startled. She slowly goes to the door. The knocking continues. Sorry, uh, we're closed. Help! Help me! Holy shit, are you okay? Let, let, let me in, please. There ain't a killer snowman out there trying to get you, is there? What? What is that supposed to mean? Haven't you heard the news? What news? So, no snowman out there trying to kill you. Oh, no, there's not a snowman out here trying to kill me. But there is an insane woman out here somewhere trying to kill me. So please, 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 would you let me the F in? Tanya makes the sign of the cross to herself. She unlocks the door and opens it and reveals Barney, fashionably dressed in a puffy winter coat, gloves, hat, scarf, and leather boots that squeak whenever he takes a step. He runs into the diner, severely out of breath, and looks for a place to hide. Tanya shuts the door and locks it again. Thank you. I owe you my life. No, no, no. This, uh, that, that won't be necessary. Uh, thank you for your concern. Hold the phone. You just barge into my diner saying there's someone trying to kill you. Don't want me to call the police. You gotta tell a girl what's going on here, Skippy. Barney, actually. Barney. Excuse me. Well, are you alright, Barney? Barney is still <laughs> exploring hiding places. Yeah, it's totally fine. You know, I'm just running away from a crazy person, as usual. It's the story of my life, really. Mm, who the hell are you running from? I didn't say. Well, aren't I just so rude barging in on you like this with virtually no explanation? Jesus Christ. I haven't even introduced myself yet. Well, actually... My name is Barney Bernard, licensed psychiatrist and new photographer on the weekends. Barney takes out his business card. Here's my card if you're ever interested in the session. Or you need someone to pretend to listen to your problems, or, or both. And yes, I do do package deals. Tanya takes the card and puts it on the counter. Thanks. I'm, I'm Tanya. Welcome to the Firecracker Diner. Can I get you a coffee, maybe, or... Oh, no, thank you. I just need a place to hide from... Well, also, it's really damn cold outside, so I didn't want to die either way. All right. So, who are you hiding from, exactly? Oh, I left that part out? Golly gee, how rude of me. Uh, please excuse my manners. I'm hiding from my wife. Your wife? Yes, my wife. Right. And she's trying to kill you. What? Oh, no, 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 no. Not actually. I just like being dramatic. And so does she. But she's really, really freaking mad at me. So I, I had to run away. It's a long story, but I mean, hey, if you got the time, I'd be happy to fill you in. But before I do, I have one question for you. What is that? If I was Barney a breadstick, looks at her very seriously. What flavor do you think I would be? What the hell kind of... Ferociously banging on the door, Tanya and Barney look towards in horror. Barney? Barney? I know you're in there. This is the only place around for miles. Open the goddamn door! I swear to God, Barney, if you don't have the balls to face me, I will go. Oh, no. oh, will... yeah, it's her. It's her. Okay, unless you want to see my testicles ripped clean off my body, just pretend I'm not here. Trust me. Just, just get rid of her. Tell her your clothes or something. You got twenty dollars. Barney reaches <sighs> into his pocket and takes out twenty dollars. Fine. Here, give me the signal when she's gone. He lowers himself slowly down behind the counter. Tanya puts the $20 in her bra, and she skates to the door, unlocks it, and opens it to reveal Nadine. She storms in in her winter gear, looking for Barney. Uh, hello, ma'am. I'm Tanya. Welcome to the Firecracker. I regret to inform you that we are actually closed for the evening. I, I know there's a terrible storm out there, so I understand you needing to get out of the cold. Tanya goes behind the bar to the phone and picks it up. Is your car broken down? Is there anyone I can call for you? Where is he? Where is who? My lousy excuse for a husband. Uh, I'm not sure I've seen him. Name's Barney Bernard, psychiatrist and nude photographer. He loves giving out his card to whoever he meets, so you'd remember him. He had to come around here. She looks around. Tanya notices Barney's card still on the counter. She smoothly grabs it when Nadine is looking away and throws it to the ground behind the counter. 
Ow! Ow. Paper cut. What was that? Tanya grabs a few receipts. Shit! It's got a little paper cut is all. Ma'am, I haven't had a customer all night, so your husband wasn't here. If you could try the brown beaver bed and breakfast about 20 miles down the road. Nadine sits down in one of the boots. No. He couldn't have gotten that far. This is the only place around for miles. If he's still out there running through this shitstorm, freezing his little white ass off, he's bound to find this place eventually. And when he does, I'll be waiting for him right here. <laughs> oh, and I'm going to beat his ass so good. <laughs> she looks at the door and watches the door closely. Um, ma'am, can I ask exactly what happened? There's a killer blizzard outside. Are you all right? Did you get stuck out there in the storm? What? Oh, the storm? Yes. We were driving through. Could barely see in front of us. Tanya goes back to the phone. Seriously, can I call for some help? It'll be futile. Nobody will come. Nobody can even make it here. Haven't you heard? It's Snowmageddon. Everyone is going crazy with this killer snowman shit. It's madness. So you heard that too? Do you think it's true? What? A killer snowman? <clears throat> That's the most gigantic pile of horse shit I've ever heard. But a storm like this is bound to make people go a little nuts. Um... Oh, speaking of nuts! Did I mention that I can't wait to rip them off that husband I keep talking about? <laughs> yeah, you mentioned that. Tanya comes to sit on a bar stool. Um, ma'am, can I ask, what did this Barney do to deserve his nuts ripped off him so aggressively? You really want the full story? I'm actually dying to know. If you insist, I've got the time. We were on our way to Oklahoma for a naked photography exhibition. Barney has some new photos being showcased of me and some other women. And he was up for an award for the posing with fruit category. Nadine's booth turns into the car. She is in the driver's seat. Barney comes out from his hiding place to sit next to her. Tanya watches and listens. The governor has just issued a travel ban due to the increasing reports of so-called killer snowmen. These reports are most likely a result of mass hysteria. However, unexplainable disappearances have also been reported. All roads are closed until sunrise. Stay in your homes, stay warm, and stay calm. From all of us here at WCLA... Sound of a door slamming open. Ah! Oh, <laughs> very funny, Daryl. That's the worst snowman costume I've ever seen. Daryl. Daryl, quit flying around. Crash. Ah! What the hell? Barney, did you just hear that? Barney is busy reading an erotic comic book and sucking on a lollipop. Hmm? What? Did you say something? Never mind. Ugh. Can't see shit in this shit. What is this goddamn map? Nadine opens the middle compartment and fishes for a map. She accidentally grabs Barney's pictures of herself posing naked with fruit. She glances at them. What the hell is this? Barney puts down the comic book and takes the lollipop out of his mouth. What do you get your paintings in a twist for now? Nadine slams on the brakes and the car slides around and then comes to an abrupt stop. Can you calm your friggin' tits, Nadine? You almost ran us off the friggin' road! Oh, you want to talk about my tits? How about my tits in your stupid fruit pictures? Cause they sure as hell are not mine. Nadine throws the photos at him. Babe, these were supposed to be a surprise. Oh, I'm beyond surprised, Barney. You were going to humiliate me at that exhibit? These are not even close to my tits, my ass, or my proportions. What, is my body just not good enough for your stupid hobby you call art? Barney sucks on the lollipop. Okay, I get why you're upset. 
I may have edited them slightly, but just think of it as an enhancement. Come on, let's just get to the exhibition. Oh, no. I'm turning this damn car around. Babe, I want my ward. Nadine accelerating the car. It skids and gets stuck in the snow. Well, you ain't getting it. Stupid car! Come on! Hey, we're stuck. Yeah, no shit. Well, I'd love to stay here and, and die with you, but I'm getting to the exhibition, goddammit. Barney opens his car door. Barney? So help me God, you are not leaving this car. Watch me, bitch! Barney gets out of, and of the car and shuts the door. He runs back to his hiding spot behind the counter, ending the flashback. Nadine gets out of the car, yells after Barney. I'll find you, Barney! I'll find you and rip those tiny testicles right off! You better run! Nadine sits back down in the booth, and the present scene continues. And then I just followed his footprints, but I lost them after a while. I know this diner was in the general direction, though. So I'll be waiting right here when he decides to show his ugly face. Ugh, that could be all night. What was that? That, that could be all night. Or never, for that matter. Ma'am... You need to go back out there and find your husband. I really think I ought to call someone for you. Tanya crosses to the phone again, but trips over Barney. He squeals. <laughs> Nadine slowly stands up. I didn't know that squeak anywhere. What? No, no, I just tripped over some coffee beans. Barney! I'm out! Barney pops up from behind the counter. Fine. The jig is up. I surrender. Come and get me. Nadine rushes behind the counter and tackles her husband to the ground. Tanya gets up out of their way and watches, not really sure what else to do but to let it happen. They struggle a bit, popping up from behind. Nadine has the clear upper hand. She slaps in, pulls his hair. He squeals even more. <clears throat> Tell me you're sorry, you little prick! No, I won't apologize. I'll never apologize. They continue to fight. A loud thumping noise comes from outside. Footsteps getting closer and louder. Nadine and Barney stop fighting. All three look towards the door. Tanya opens the cabinet and fishes inside for something. The noise stops. The hell? You don't think. Tanya Both of whips you? around with a shotgun in her hand. Both of you, stay behind the counter. The two put their hands up and nod their heads frantically. Tanya cocks the gun slowly, skates to the door. She puts her ear against it. Another loud boom. Barney screams. Tanya <laughs> jumps back away from the door. She slowly moves to a window and looks out from behind the blinds. She screams and falls into the booth seat. Oh! It's true, isn't it? Tanya, what's out there? Oh, Lord, not today! Tanya, what did you see out there? Snowman! They're real! Nadine comes out from behind the counter. Bullshit. Is this some kind of sick joke? I'm gonna see for myself. Nadine goes to, unlock, goes to the door and unlocks it. Barney goes after her. No, you, you can't. He blocks the door. I won't let you die, Nadine, no matter how much I'd like to see it. Get away, Barney. Nadine shoves him and opens the door. Barney gets back in her way. Oh! Barney is torn away from the doorway and yanked outside. He screams. Tanya rushes over and points the gun outside, stomping, chewing, and crunching noises as Barney dies. The two women watch in horror. Tanya slams the door shut and locks it. Noises stop. Well. That, then. He just... He was eaten by a killer snowman? Oh, Lord. I guess it is today. What do we do now? Well, let's start by not opening that door. I don't think they th these things are interested in coming inside. They'll melt, right? If we just stay put and wait it out, maybe there's hope. The lights flicker off. Oh, shit. Don't move. The lights flicker back on. The radio suddenly turns on and a news person's voice is heard. Tanya crosses to the radio, listening intently. Nadine remains by the door. Ladies and gentlemen, this just in. 
We may have just reached the end of the world. The rumors are true. There are indeed actual killer snowmen wreaking havoc, not only in this state, but across the entire country. In the truly horrific blizzard of the century, we are shitting you not. I repeat, shitting you not. No matter how curious you are, do not, under any circumstances, open that door. Well, I give up. It was nice meeting you. Nadine unlocks the door. That means you. Yeah, you there with your hand on the door. Nadine, wait! You can't! Don't worry about me. Nadine opens the door and steps outside, crunching and chewing noises. Tanya screams and shuts the door. She locks it and sits back down with her back against it, clutching the gun. Footsteps boom closer. The lights go out again. Tanya screams again. The snowmen bust down the door. Tanya fires the gun in the darkness. All the noises stop, and the lights come up after a moment. Tanya sits, official-like, in a dark blue business attire, across from Barney and Nadine in a booth, like nothing ever happened. The two women have coffee cups in front of them. Barney has an ice cream sundae in front of him. Barney, beaming from ear to ear, takes a bite of his ice cream sundae. And that is our idea for the new Pepsi commercial. It took some serious brainstorming, but we think it's solid. So, what do you think? Mm -hmm. Tanya gives them the biggest what-the-fuck look in the world. I know. We need to work out some kinks, but overall, I think it could be crazy enough to work. It really should those cult bitches who's number one. <laughs> Am I right, bitches? <laughs> Do you have any questions for us, Miss Briggs? Yes, just one. Uh, remind me again, when does the Pepsi product come in? Do we, leave, do we leave that part out? <laughs> How silly of me. So the snowmen bust down the door and are about to kill her. But then, of course, they all meld and leave behind one nicely chilled Pepsi bottle. She grabs it, takes a sip, and gives the camera a smile. The end. Barney and Aideen clap for themselves. Tanya, nodding her head slowly. I see. Well, the story sure is elaborate, and the language is a bit strong. Do you think maybe you could turn it down just a little and condense it into a 30-second commercial? Maybe do without the whole suicide part? Um, um. I, I guess. You know what? Yeah, we, we could. We could cut out. I mean, we, we could we cut out the I suicide. Yeah, Maybe some of I guess the nuts jokes. Need suicide. Sure, Maybe we can make it PG. if you need. Well, that's good to know. But honestly, I've heard a lot of pitches in my day, and this one may be the worst idea I have ever heard. And and please, melting killer snowmen that reveal the drink. Come on. It's been done a thousand times. I cannot believe I just sat here on my day off in this freaking diner, wasting my time listening to you two morons. You call yourselves writers? Ha! <laughs> Tanya composes herself just... and takes a sip of coffee. You know what? I told myself I wouldn't do this, but screw it. I'm just going to go with the effing dancing lobsters. Those guys really know how to sell a product. Thank you both for your time. I will now be reclaiming mine. And you will not be hearing from me again. She gets up and declares, Bring in the dancing lobsters! Fun dance music plays. Barney and Nadine cry in each other's arms. Tanya struts to the front door in a pair of killer stiletto heels. She exits the diner and slams the door behind her. Blackout. End of play. What a throwback, Matt Riddler. Honestly, obsessed. Um... Thank you so much for your play. Uh, it was wonderfully weird, as we love here at GBP. Um, and before we go off into the next play, and before I hand it off to Layla, just one more super quick special shout out to our friends, our patrons. Um, and if you want to be a patron, there is always time. It, the door is always open for you. So big special thank you to Katie Schwebka, Ryan Schlia, Wayne Conover, Sean Cheeky, Leslie Cairns, Sarah Henderson, Zoe Kiriazis, Deanna Hariluck, Leslie Lusterman, Kelly Buth, Scott Seifritz, Elizabeth Pope, Lori Mara, Gwendolyn Davis, Laura Walford, Derry Howell, Pete Sheldon, Brian Shearer, Susan Miles, Emily Beistrack, 
Chris Barker, Elizabeth, oh gosh, Alyssa Grace Adams, Ryan Henderson, Hen nope, it's not, Ryan Henneberger, my bad. See, this is what happens. Uh, there's a lot of patrons. David Waisaki, Jack Levine, Kayla Ruman, and Sarah Emerling. And big, huge, special, super cool shout out to both Pete, Sheldon, and Jack Levine um, who have given us some prompts to use. You too can give us prompts to use for the coming weeks for our um, April reading if you become a patron at any level. And now Layla with the last play. Thank you so much, Maddie. Alrighty then, so I will be reading uh, The Last Spin Cycle by Hannah Lee DeFreitz. Um, in this play, uh, the dialogue ha that had to be used, it could be any of the three or all three if people wanted. It was, to tell you the truth, I think we've been scammed. I want folks who've never met me to miss me when I'm gone or, to be honest, I just don't even think of you at all. The three props that had to be used were a blackout curtain, forks, and playing cards. And I believe the setting that was used was a laundry Yes, it was. Okay. Um, so I will be reading that. And I have Meadowlark being played by Heidi Buckler and Caraway being played by Chad Short. And I will be reading the stage directions. So The Last Spin Cycle by Hannah Lee Differs. At rise, the sound of a dryer si beginning a cycle pierces the darkness. Lights up on a basement laundry floor. The floor is made of stained black and white linoleum. The walls are peeling and yellowed. On one wall, there is a roll of washers. On another, a row of dryers. On another wall hangs a succession of sepia-ed photo portraits of people in vintage-looking clothing. There are two windows and a door, but all three are covered in thick blackout curtains so that the only light comes from a flickering overhead fluorescent. In one corner of the room, there is a red thermoplastic coated picnic table strewn with plastic play setting and faded playing cards. Meadowlark, a plague doctor, sits at the end of one of the benches. 56 bottles of crap on the wall, 56 bottles of crap. <laughs> Take one down, pass it around. Fifty-five bottles of crap on the wall. Fifty-five bottles of crap on the wall. Fifty-five bottles of crap. Take one down, pass it around. Fifty-four bottles of crap on the wall. Fifty-four bottles of crap. The door opens and through the curtains come three additional plague doctors, Sage, Time, and Caraway. Sage and Time force Caraway onto the bench, chaining them to the picnic table and leaving from whence they came. As soon as they leave, Meadowlark continues. Take one down, pass it around. Fifty-three bottles of crap on the wall. Fifty-three bottles of crap on the wall. Fifty-five bottles of crap. Take one down, pass it around. Fifty-two bottles of crap on the wall. Caraway puts their head in their head hands. Fifty-two bottles of crap on the wall. Fifty-two bottles. Of Could you please not? What? I think you know what. Oh, the song? Yes. I think it's a nice song. It isn't. And it doesn't even make any sense. Why would anyone, first of all, have so many bottles of crap? And why would they take them down and pass them around? <sighs> Fine. We can sing something else. Row, row, row your boat. No. Seriously? What do you suggest I sing, then? Could you just not sing? Please. What else do you expect me to do? I don't know. Just please let me have a moment. You know what? No. I was here first. That's not exactly something to be proud of. Maybe not. But I've got seniority, so... How are you so calm? Who said I was calm? Sorry. You just don't seem worried. I know what happens here. Why worry about what's inevitable? Easy for you to say. They sit in silence for a moment. Then, spotting a broken plastic fork on the table, Caraway picks it up and begins to attempt to carve their name into the table. A horrible squeaking, scraping noise results. God, uh, so you're allowed to do that, but I can't sing? Sorry, I'll be done in a minute. What are you trying to do? Make my mark. 
Like a dog? Ew, no. I just want to leave something of me behind. My name, at least. What are you doing that for? I want folks who've never met me to miss me when I'm gone. And you think that'll do it? I don't know. Maybe. I... It's all I got. You're a fool. Well, we can't all just sit here nonchalantly. What do you expect me to do? I don't even know why I'm talking to you. Okay, then stop. I guess I just... Thought we would band together and escape or something? Would never work. Because let me tell you, these fellas... They tug at the chains anchoring them to the table. Unbreakable. They don't talk for a while. I'm sorry, but this just isn't fair. Ugh. Aren't you at least a little upset? Yeah, at you. Because I'm pissed. Because to tell you the truth, I think we've been scammed. How do you figure? It isn't enough they got our pasts and our presents, but now they get to take our futures away. They shouldn't have that kind of power. It's... You had a future? Good for you, buddy! Well, I mean, there were things that I wanted. Plans. Goals, I guess. And what were they? I don't think I want to tell you. Teach them all! You wanted silence, so I gave you silence. But then you wanted to talk, so I'm talking. And now you don't wanna? Make up your mind! Is it not enough that we're here? Why must you torture me? Me? Torture you? That's what I said. So are we talking or not? Well, I'd rather not sit in silence. <laughs> Talk. You said something about plans or something? I, uh... On second thought, it might be a little personal. I, uh... Fine. I don't want to talk about that anyway. Then why... <sighs> I just thought you did. N not with you. I mean, I don't even know you. They sit for a moment and let the words sink in. Then, Meadowlark takes off their hat and mask and plops it onto the table. Meadowlark. Oh. Um, I'm Caraway. Caraway removes their headgear as well. Cool. Cool. Caraway. Meadowlark. <laughs> so are you going to cut the crap now and tell me your freaking thing or what? Okay. But you have to promise not to laugh. Meadowlark attempts to cross their heart. I wanted a full life. A job. To get married. To have a family. To be happy. Pretty generic stuff. Stupid, right? Doesn't matter, though. Not anymore, anyway. De la vie, c'est le mot. Is that supposed to make me feel better? No, I don't know how to make you feel better. I was just speaking French. Cool. But hey, what if you could still have all of that stuff you wanted? But you said... I know, but I mean, what if we did all of it here? Now? What other time have we got? Okay. Fine. <laughs> Let's do it, I guess. Meadowlark sits up straight, picking up a plastic fork and a playing card as if they were a pad and a pen. Your credentials are remarkable and your references impeccable. So, Dr. Caraway, what do you think you could bring to this job? I... Um... I believe myself to be quite skilled in the art of bloodletting. Ah, uh, yes. I see here some have referred to you as the Leech Whisperer. Yes, that is true. The leeches hear my voice and obey. Impressive, impressive. How flexible are you with your schedule? I, I am very flexible. Ah, can you do a split? Right here? Whenever you're ready. I, uh, can't do a split. Good, good. That was a test. Acrobatics distract from the profession. 
It is a very good thing that you are not engaged in that tomfoolery. Well, Dr. Carraway, you have proven to us that you are more than qualified. We look forward to you joining us at the practice. I got the job? You got the job! Congratulations! Now what's next? You want to get married, right? Uh, yeah, but... Great, let's get married then! For real? I mean, you can't just fake getting married. Oh, uh, Metal Arc, uh, I don't know how to say this, but when I said I wanted to be married to someone, I, well, to be honest, I just don't think of you at all. You think I think of you? Fair point. Besides, you didn't say anything about love. You just said marriage, and I can do that. Okay. The two turn away from each other, busy themselves making bouquets of old playing cards and head ornaments of plastic utensils. You ready? As I'll ever be. Slowly, they turn to face each other. Meadowlark hums a wedding march. Caraway tosses torn up pieces of playing card like rose petals. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to join this doctor and this doctor in holy matrimony. Meadowlark. Do you take care away to have and to hold, in plague or in health, till death do you part? I do. And do you, Caraway, take metal lark to have and hold, in plague or health, till death do you part? I do. Now the rings. Oh, crap! I forgot about the rings! No, you didn't. Here they are. Metal lark slips their finger into one of the links on their chains. Caraway follows suit. I now pronounce you Mary. You may now kiss your spouse. The two strain as far forward as their chains will allow, which is not far. They eventually settle for air kisses. After, Meadowlark picks up a plastic plate from the table and chucks it at the floor. Uh The plate doesn't break, but instead clatters against the linoleum, remaining intact. Both of them lose their composure, breaking into shared fits of laughter. (laughs) So we're married now. So we are. Now what? Just give it a moment. Take it all in. It is your wedding day after all. They take a moment of silence. Okay. Let's go on our honeymoon. Honeymoon? Yeah, of course. What? How? It's a logical next step. Besides, you said you wanted a family. Yeah, but maybe not now. Seeing as, and, oh, so you see? Yeah, we're going to do it anyway. I say we honeymoon in the laundry room. I say we don't. Party pooper. No, hold on. Because it's not the laundry room where we are. Oh? It is the beach. A beautiful tropical island. Feel the warmth? The two stop and observe the humidity of the room. Smell the soft breeze. They sniff the air, catching whiffs of laundry detergent. Hear the waves splashing upon the sand. They listen for the sound of the dryer tumbling and whirring. You're right, and it's all very beautiful, my love. Okay, time to make a baby. Uh... I meant start our family. Meadowlark, sweetheart, let's just not. Meadowlark does not take no for an answer. They make an obscene gesture. Grimacing, Caraway mimics it back at them. Then Meadowlark picks up a card from the table and flashes it at their spouse. It bears the king of spades. Here's our son. Isn't he the ugliest baby you've ever seen? (laughs) Oh... Oh, yeah, he's pretty hideous. He gets that from your side of the family. (laughs) Well, either way, what shall we call him? How about Reginald? Reginald? That's an awful name. Call a spade a spade, and I say we call this one Reginald. If you insist. They laugh. Meadowlark slides the Reginald card across the table. Caraway catches it and mimes rocking it to sleep. Good night, sweet boy. This world is screwed, but here's hoping you won't be. 
Eventually, Caraway puts the card down. As they do, they notice the dryer that has been tumbling the whole time has begun to slow. Finally asleep. Now it's just me and you. So, Meadowlark, we're married now, but I don't know a single thing about you. There's not much to tell. I'd be interested in anything you were willing to tell. Nah. Come on. I shared my thing. And I mean, we're technically married, so it would be nice to know something about you. Fine. Okay. I... Beep! The beeping of the dryer. At the sound of it, Meadowlark's demeanor softens. I'm dying today. What? Meadowlark. The sound of a door. In through the curtains come Sage and Time. The two go over to the table, unchain Meadowlark, seizing them and pulling them to their feet. Meadowlark does not struggle. No. Put them down. You can't just do that. You, you can't just leave me. Not like this. It's not fair. Meadowlark. Good thing we didn't say anything about love. Just marriage. <laughs> It's a good thing. Sage and Time begin to lead Meadowlark away. Meadowlark. Her away. Thank you for the future, love. Sage and Time force Meadowlark out through the curtains, leaving Caraway alone to dissolve into the feelings they are feeling. Then, after a moment... 99 bottles of crap on the wall... 99 bottles of crap. Take one down, pass it around. 98 bottles of crap on the wall. 98 bottles of... The lights fade to black. End of play. Thank you so much for reading that. I know it was kind of a weird one, but it was so well written, so I was very excited to have it. Uh, read this evening. So thank you to all our wonderful actors who joined us this evening. It really was a huge pleasure working with you all. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us this evening, for listening to these great plays. And we hope you have a wonderful rest of the evening. <laughs>